So I want to go ahead and introduce the members of the panel. Some of them have already um, spoken. So we have um, Carrie Brand from Plantronics with us. <clears throat> we have Dr. Lorenzo Bernay from Cisco. Um, this is his first time speaking at this um, meeting. So he's with the MediaNet team at Cisco, and he focuses on monitoring, troubleshooting, and improving the quality of multimedia transmission, as well as managing software development projects. Very busy guy. His interest includes signal and image processing, approximation, compression, and transmission. He previously worked um, in design development for other multimedia systems, including video coding and streaming. Prior to Cisco, he was with NTT Docomo, University of Surrey, BBC Research, and Amino Communications. And he holds a PhD degree in signal processing from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Okay, so welcome, Lorenzo. And then our other panelist is Alex. We all know Alex. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and I'm not pronouncing the last name. I, I did try and work on that, never could quite get it right. Now, Jeff Pulver was going to sit in with us, but um, I don't know if he's already headed to the airport. If he comes in, he'll join us. We all know Jeff. And um, we originally supposed to have Yannick Meher from Orange, but he had to leave early for a business meeting, which is why Alex stepped in to be on our panel. So <clears throat> what we're going to be talking about is the fact we've been working on SIP and 323 for 15 plus years. You know, the, the SIP folks have been saying, oh, SIP is ready for prime time. The standards work is primarily focusing on things, really getting it ready for being deployed in the open internet and replacing, for example, the, the PSTN, Published Switch Telephone Network. We've had things like Skype around, they just had their 10 year anniversary, so we've had a lot of multimedia communications enabled for the past 10 years. It's been quite ubiquitous, actually. So the question becomes, you know, what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years, in 20 years, with, with our protocols? How, are you, how, will we, how will we evolve? And so this is why these gentlemen are here, and we're going to talk about some, I'm going to throw some questions out. We're going to kind of brainstorm a little bit. This isn't pre-scripted, so um, just to get some ideas on the table. So let's start with, and a lot of these um, questions and topics are going to be things that have been touched on in a lot of the other presentations. So we're going to kind of just gather some additional perspectives on um, some of the issues. For example, the use of video right now is around 20% in enterprise environments. So the question is, and again, some of this has been touched on, is it the technology, the usability, or human nature that's impacting why it's not as widely used, right? And so then the question I also have for the panelists is how do they see video evolving in the next 10 years or so? So. Um, Gary, you want to start? Oh, sure. <laughs> so, um, so I use video quite a bit. I, I actually I work for a company in Santa Cruz, California, uh, but I live in Seattle, and I have a I have a uh, a very nice video system uh, in my office. Um, and it's, I think you know, for the most part, it helps me feel more connected when I'm a remote worker. So I think psychologically, it helps me. Um, not so much sure about the uh, the organization down in Santa Cruz. Uh, it uh, sometimes can be a hindrance, you know, from, from today. It's not quite perfect, um, especially when there's glitches. And I think uh, there's like a certain expectation of perfection when we're doing video right. conferencing. Right, so you're saying there still are technology issues that we need a to overcome. Absolutely. You know? um, and, you know, with audio, I think we're, w once you start getting art artifacts in audio, it's, it's distracting. And the same with video. Once you start getting, it, it diminishes the collaboration. So I think uh, we have opportunities to improve that. Um, the uh, the other the other thing is the perception. I think uh, as we see more and more people working from home, smarter working, we're going to see the adoption of video. I think uh, increase as well. So I think tastes are going to change uh, over time. Okay, um, Alex, do you have any comments on that one? Uh, yeah, well, I guess it's very important to ensure uh, the, 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 the transparent video experience, and I think that's that's essential. And in the past, that was not possible. So. Uh, I think all the efforts that were made to sort of sell, if you wish, video as a, as, a, as a business tool, as a collaboration tool failed because as soon as somebody used any system, it doesn't matter who, who was a manufacturer, like it, was, it was essentially flawed as, a, as, a, a, as an experience for the end user. So I think now, now we're at a point where we actually have accomplished a transparent experience. By that I mean that being in a video session where you don't have glitches, you don't have lost frames or distortions that are visible, 
and where the delay is as low uh, as a telephone call. Mm -hmm. okay? That is possible today. Mm -hmm. It exists today. So as an experience, it is possible. Now, you have to make that available to people so that they are aware that it exists, one. Two, you have to integrate it in the daily workflow. So, so uh, if you look at video applications, uh, typically the, you know, all the engineering work and the ingenuity, if you wish, uh, exists well below the graphical user interface and well below the components of the application that will allow you to get your work done. In other words, as soon as video works, that's good enough. But unfortunately today, we need more than that. So, so I think we are at the point where we solve the transparency issue, okay? But we need to absolutely uh, train our users, by the way, to, to use like high quality audio, avoid feedback. That's not a question for software, right? That's something that the user has to be aware to avoid. But more than that, we have to integrate, we allow the application to be integrated in people's uh, uh, workflows. And now, myself, I've been, you know, I live in Athens, Greece. That's my home base. Now, the, comp the company I work uh, in is uh, video is in, in New Jersey, okay? And of course, we have people all over the world. So for me, uh, video is, is my work. I mean, I, I get, you know, all my, nearly all my meetings are, 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 are video meetings. And, and so I think that a good test a good test of if, if the technology is good enough is, is to, to see if, if a video-enabled employee makes sure to have uh, a speakerphone or a headset always available, okay? Uh, if they don't, they, they, don't have, they haven't you know, integrated it. So for me, you know, wherever I go, I have that. And by the way, I don't have a, I don't have a dedicated video setup. I just have a big you know, the Apple, uh, uh, displays, laptop that I connect to, and that's it. That's my sort of video setup. Right, so you're uh, saying some of it has to do with conditioning users and, and conditioning training users to how to optimize their own experience. Yes, okay. and that the quality, of, uh, the quality of the video has to be superb. We cannot, be, right. we cannot be asking users to embrace a technology that has flaws. In other words, it's, yeah. we're asking too much. Lorenzo, you have yeah, any comments I'd, on that topic? I'd like to, to stress the last word you say, quality. Because we, we have quality, but quality is, is, is a key aspect. I mean, quality should be there, should be monitored, should be I mean, guaranteed, and, and that's, the, well, that's a key aspect. We, we have technically, but it's not available to everybody everywhere now. So this is, the, I think, it's the first point to increase usability. I don't think video will replace the everything. I mean, 20% we can increase a lot, but I think sometimes I need, I like to make a phone call. Sometimes I just write, I don't know, an email. It depends. So video will increase, but a lot, but I don't think it will be 100%. Uh, but that, okay, that's my point of view. I have, I have well, two, two nice stories. Once I was in a meeting, there was a guy sitting close to me, and he looked at my badge and said, oh, you work for Cisco. Oh, really, you, you, you saved my life because before I was traveling so much and now thanks to telepresence, I'm traveling half of the time and I'm much happier, my family is much happier and like this. And, and so it was great, really great feedback for video communication. At the same time, there was another guy which I met one hour after that says, you know, we have telepresence uh, and now I don't use telepresence anymore or I use a bit less and less, because it's like going to a phone box. So I need to book the room, I need to take the stairs, go downstairs, hope that nobody else is using it, and move there. It's great, the quality is super, but I, I enjoy the meetings, but sometimes it's not what I need. And it's like having a phone box. I mean, I was using phone box, we, everybody was using it, but with, since I have a mobile, not anymore. So again, that's the one challenge, and everybody now is speaking about mobile, but yeah, it's, uh, it right. has to come, it has to come. Yeah, yeah. yeah I wanted to add to that. I think that they use, you know, people are trained to, to, to engage with technology, and I think now everybody's now used to, 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 uh, to solutions that are delivered as, you know, as, uh, uh, over the web or the cloud. So I think the paradigm of offering the communications experience through a website is key. So. Okay. Even if there is dedicated equipment somewhere, I think what the user, the most convenient way to deliver it to a, to a, to a, to a user is through, through a URL, okay? So whether the service is offered through a cloud or through some sort of hidden hardware somewhere else, 
But I think that's essential. And I think that, that that's already happening. I mean, you know, Blue Jeans is a very good example. Everybody, I think everybody in the community now operates through that. And that, that, that's wonderful for the end user because they don't have to mess around with specialized software to schedule right. this and that. You just drop a URL somewhere in an Outlook invite or in a Skype chat or whatever, and boom, you're, you're good to go. I think that's a key. I, I think also on the user side, there's, there's still, the, you mentioned, both of us, I, I think all three of us mentioned training. And I think the, the technology is not perfect yet because we still need to train people how to use it. Uh, when I do tele video conferencing, I don't look at the screen when I want to make a point. I look at the camera. And that kind of is something that users have to learn uh, in order to use the system effectively. So I think if, if we start to see more like cameras in line with the display where you're looking at it naturally, it'll actually make it easier for, for users to adopt. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks guys. So um, the next question or topic I wanted to throw out, and it's unfortunate that Jeff Pulver isn't still here, because I wanted to throw out this topic of, within the U.S., the government has mandated, or this is what they would like, is to transition the PSTN, Public Switch Telephone Network, to be all IP, the infrastructure to be all IP by 2018. It's not that far out. So the question is, what are some of those challenges to doing that, and how may that impact some of the traditional service providers? Are we going to see some convergence and such? Simon? Well, he has to. Hello? Yeah. Okay, you got it. Um, some of the, the discussions that we've had is particularly around the area of accessibility. Accessibility has been a, a really big area that has been overlooked by most of the manufacturers right. so far. So the transition from, from, from the markets that we, we are involved in are very involved in how do you bring accessibility for you know, universal service? This has been a really big challenge. I mean, uh, the, the vendors have gone ahead and built up what they think is the, the, the future of, of IP communication, but they have not necessarily involved the idea of accessibility. How do you support deaf people? How do you support um, blind people? How do you bring all that universal service like the telephone has? Because the telephone already has the ability to have captioning. It has the existing services. Right. And that's the big challenge that, um, that we, we, we discovered uh, earlier this year when we were, we were in discussion with the FCC. Right. That's just to raise that point. Right. No, and that's a very important concept, right? That you must have these accessibility services that are available from the get-go, right? You, you can't tell people your PSTN is gone and you don't have, you know, any way for the, like you said, the deaf to communicate and such, yeah. And there is work underway. There is for the, the FCC has asked SIF Forum to work on a specification, for example, for the video relay service, which is what, you know, a service that the hearing impaired use now. So, you guys have comments? I'm, I'm just curious as to how, like, you know, do, do we have an adequate, you know, emergency respond, first responder system in place for this? I mean, this, this is Right, and, and that's a that. really valid point, right? Because we still have not fully deployed, you know, the, the emergency services work that IETF has developed. That's still not been fully deployed mm. in, in networks, right? So that, that doesn't exist everywhere, right? It's not ubiquitous yet. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I certainly, you know, hearing this, I feel a little bit, hmm. <laughs> Uh, it's concerned. <laughs> right, uh, right. So the question is, yeah, is it realistic concerned. within five years, right? I mean, I personally don't think so either because over 10 years ago, some of this stuff were things that we needed in SIP, right? In terms of running real SIP networks, we didn't have all the building blocks and we actually still don't have all of them, right? <laughs> and an another, another issue, particular issue was with regard to accessibility was the ability for deaf people within corporations to be able to access the mm -hmm. services. And the biggest problem yeah. they had, and uh, it was the biggest problem with the existing system, was the ability for nat traversal, which Alagu did point on to. Right. And right. The, the point is that these, these are generally very secure. They do not want to open up all their ports, so stun turn ice doesn't right. really work. Right. They've got to be able to you know, have a system or a process where they can only limit it to a small number of ports to a particular address, so it makes it very easy to, to get, get accessibility for, that, right. for the deaf community as well. That's a bit of another issue. Right, but that's, that's just one building block, one technical hurdle that, that needs to be overcome, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, even like user sentiment, I mean, if everything is, you know, becomes IP based and uh, you get rid of all the, you know, uh, what does that mean for like NSA type things? You know, there's all sorts of, you, you may have uh, public sentiment not, uh, not too happy with this. Uh, right, right. And that's why some of, that's why I wanted to touch on some of the security and privacy aspects, right? Yeah. That are going to be coming down the road, in particular if you make this transition, right? 
uh, there are enough security mechanisms in there for the user and for the service provider at the same time, balancing with what um, <laughs> <laughs> the information that certain people think they have a right to access, right? Exactly. Um, and then the privacy concerns for the user. I mean, we talked about, you know, video, is it automatically going to be on when you start a session, right? And then the question is, what triggers video yeah. to, to, to go off, right? You switch web pages, for example, with WebRTC. If you had an audio video session set up, does that automatically turn off? Or is your camera still enabled, yeah. right? So, the, some the, of the challenges. The, there's, a, there's another twist to the story. It's, you know, the, the, when we converted from analog TV to digital TV, the argument was, whoa, you're going to get pristine quality, superb television exactly. signal. Exactly. Guess yeah. what happened? The, the people who were running the service, they, they used the encoders in a very low bitrate mode. So in actual fact, I've been in many places, many hotels, oh, yeah. for example, right, where the quality is just awful. Oh, I have that in my own home. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a TV station. I cannot get ABC in my house with my HDTV. So, yeah. so, so the transition, you know, when you are on copper, right, yeah. the quality is given. You can't play with it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's defined by the yeah. reach. When you go digital, in theory, you have HD voice, right? right. In theory, practice, in though, because the company will want to save money, they will give you the... You know, the awful quality that I often get on my cell phone, which is, God forbid, I mean, that, that would be the, the quality that I would live with right. all day long, right? right. So, so, uh, so if we ever do the switch, I would truly like to see minimum quality levels, okay, uh, with, with uh, uh, so, you know, objective testing right. to make right. sure that the right. carrier does not right. use like a one kilobit, you know, codec because they right. want to sign up another right. million users, right. okay? Exactly. Good point. But do you think it can open also opportunity to, I don't know, for interoperability or new services? Or Because I see a lot of problems, but I see a big potential for this transition. Right, right. And, and how can it be leveraged when it actually happens? Exactly. Yeah. And then that would provide the motivation, for example, for people actually putting the quality networks in place to be able to provide services, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's complicated. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, right. it's, uh, it sort of looks like you plug it in and it works, but uh, right. we if all you know, think what right, happens, yeah. right, well, you plug yeah. a, a, a computer on a network, all the protocols that have to run, you know, to do the, you know, oh, yeah. right, <laughs> map to IP, blah, right, blah, 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 right. I mean, it's, eh? right. Well, and we know what it's taken just to get to the level of interoperability we have for SIP right now, right? Yeah. It's, you know, not, well not over an easy, uh, not an easy path, eh? Well over yeah. a decade. So yeah. I think we're probably all, maybe perhaps even all in this room agreeing that five years is probably not going to see when, it. When is Henning's, when is Henning's uh, tenure at FCC end? I, well, it's coming up, I believe. Well, he can't work right now, you realize. What do you mean? He's on furlough. The U.S. government is shut down, so Henning, oh, yes, yes. The, the, yeah, True. the CTO yeah. of the FCC is not working right now. Yes. He cannot use his email account. He can post. In fact, I don't know. We're supposed to meet next week in Chicago. Well, you I don't can't know if he's going to come. No, he's he won't be come. there. He will okay. not be able to be there. Right. Yeah. Oh. But when does his. Uh, uh, I think it's coming. I don't have the exact date. Okay, it's okay. coming up. It is coming okay. up. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, that, it's Henning Schultrini. <laughs> right. Henning, sorry. Well, Henning, 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 Henning Schultrini is the current CTO of the FCC, but his term is coming up fairly soon. So, okay, yeah, yeah. so his yeah. continued participation in that yeah. role would be crucial, I think, right, for the push right. towards uh, yeah. you know, packet-based, well, right. uh, IP-based solution. Right, right. And it's yeah. crucial because he has the technology background. He was one of the people that developed the original SIP protocol right. and that sort of thing. So it's, they will need somebody of that caliber was, engaged. Um, yeah. and we, with Jonathan we, at Cisco and, uh, and Henning at uh, Jonathan Rosenberg. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Can I so, Columbia. <laughs> They go back oh, to Jonathan, Jonathan Rosenberg, he's at Cisco. He's at Cisco now, yet again, yes. So they will want to on push the, on for... The particular <laughs> issue, on the particular issue, the current accessibility system in the US is based on 323. It's completely H323 end to end. And uh, there was a big push within the SIP forum to migrate everything to a unified system, which, which as you were talking about, a universal service system. And uh, there is a lot of resistance from within the, the community of well, the unknown. The That's a really the big problem. The resistance was within the community that provides the special built equipment right now yes. for those networks, right? Yes. And the billing model that they have and their, you know, their business model, that was where the resistance was, right? It, it hugely impacts that business model. Because theoretically, the idea is that you don't need a special built device to be able to use this video relay service. You use your iPad, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you, you, anybody can use that service, right? So yeah. 
So the yeah. biggest problem is how to transition from that. So not only is it the future yeah. of communication, is you've also got this proliferation of different devices that are out there already, right. whether they're SIP or 3 to 3 or whatever. And right. accessibility is a classic example where the entire network and every single device is basically, they're all 3 to 3 backbone, enum based system. But to transition that to a SIP system, that Henny was thought of just like having a, an anvil go, as of today, it's all going to be SIP. And, and that's like, we, we, and then, and then yeah. that's not necessarily the, 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 you have to be some sort of transition, transition exactly, process. Exactly, exactly. There has to be a transition plan, yes. And that, this is what, part of what he's been trying to instigate, right? Meeting with different people to try and instigate that, right? Yeah. Because theoretically, once we do that, then video should be ubiquitous, right? It's, there should be, you know, other but there's still There's still a whole lot of range of, of issues that haven't been, that need to be addressed exactly. as well. Exactly. And they need to be standardised, and and, they, and the SIP forum are doing some work in that area. Right. But there still needs a lot more work. In oh, that it area. does absolutely. I mean, they, they're, 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 only the tiniest bit has been. Yes. You know, correct. is being addressed right now. Yeah. Yes. Totally agree. Yeah. So I mean, this this is an interesting. I mean, from the business perspective, is this like the end of on-premise equipment? I mean, do vendors not sell anymore on-premise if you can just you know if you've got a data pipe coming in that's you know SIP based out to the carrier? Does does on-premise equipment go away? I mean, that's a good question, right? Yeah, and I mean, part, if, I some think of that, that gets into I think some of the security aspects and whether or not they're still going to want their SVCs and what they want blocking within an enterprise, for example, from you know the open network, right? Right. Or does that just get yeah elevated out to the to the carrier and the, it, the carriers provide all of the uh, all of this functionality? I, I don't know. Right. No, it's a good question, and it, that's why one of the reasons why it would have been really good to have a service mm -hmm. provider on the panel to kind of. Yeah. Um, talk to that perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah. So in very interesting challenges coming up. So let me throw another topic out here. Let me look at my cheat sheet here. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and talk about this one. We've talked about it um, quite a bit, the WebRTC. So my, my question on this isn't whether or not it's going to take off. People are already using it right now, even though it's not actually a standard right now. The, the, the specs are being developed, but nothing has been formally standardized in terms of WebRTC right now. Um, but my question is, how important do people think interoperability with existing voice and video networks is going to be? Well, I think we had, listening to the presentation the last days, I think we had an answer. I think almost everybody spoke about interoperability. I think it's, it's one of the key messages out of this forum is that interoperability right. will be needed, will be the key. It's, it's, it's fundamental. Right, but the interesting aspect of the standardization work in WebRTC, it is not a priority for them at all to ensure that they can, you know, interoperate with the plain old SIP endpoint. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I was thinking about it, uh, uh, you know, a related, I think a very related question is, are the signaling protocols that were designed in the, in the mid-90s, are they sufficient right. to do yeah. the applications right, we can do today? You know, I was a PhD student at the time, and a lot of these protocols was designed, you know, when people were doing multimedia and multicast, you know, NASA launches and this right, and that. Right, right. And, and so there is all of that mentality embedded in the specification. So, so right. with WebRTC, uh, one of the good aspects is that it actually cuts away through that decision, and it says, you know, yeah. uh, I don't know, yeah. but what I can do is give you the tools to establish the connection but you are responsible for writing the code both ways. Now, because the web is an instant software delivery platform, meaning you don't need the software, I'll send you the software when you visit my, my, my website, right? right? So you get the code, I have the code on the server, we can talk, why? Because I wrote the code on both ends. I, if I want to use SIP or whatever else, you know, it's up to me, or if I want to use the same state machine and, and use different signaling, I mean, different way to signal, that's, that's my own uh, prerogative. So I think it's essential to leave WebRTC alone to go free, because it doesn't have to follow a particular signaling uh, path. To talk from one WebRTC entity, from the client, right, right to, to whoever provided the code, because that's, that's, really, you know, that's really what it is. I mean, the, 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 the client, right, only needs to talk to the, to the service provider, okay, for a particular service, let's say, that is being offered. So, so my argument right. would be better not tie that chain to WebRTC, let it be free, and then if you need to talk to legacy, which of course is important because you right. want to talk right. to people right. with, okay, right. then that's, that's, that's something to be offered as a, as a value-added service, 
There are commercial right. ladies that are offering this type of service, right. okay? And, and uh, the, the gateway or the SBC The gateway, or is, you know, right. with, with, yeah. with the gateway, you know, yeah. co companies like uh, like Blue Jeans that they essentially go from anywhere to anywhere, yeah. okay? And that's that's very valuable service, right. and of mm -hmm. course it's needed. Right. But I think it'd be a mistake to to you know to weigh down uh, something which yeah. whose power is really truly the fact that it's not tied to any particular mm -hmm. uh, uh, solution. Right. Is that, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that makes sense from the application yeah. level perspective, yeah. right? In terms of how they're going with their detailed protocol work, there's we we can debate the choices there, but the end objective of the application is the, the decoupling. From the decoupling, yes. right? Yes. The decoupling. Yes. And then, if you want, you know, I guess one you could argue when if you do if you do how do you do peer to peer? I mean, you, you connect the server, you get the code, but then if I'm talking to you, our, my media, you know, I wanted to go. Directly. Okay, in that instance, we better be using the same uh, system. Right. Okay, we cannot. Well, if we need exactly. conversion, right. you go right. through a server. Right. Not, the, not right. the end of the world. Right. Not right. the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I, I just, I, I agree. Mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, 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 another, <laughs> sorry. No, no, go, go ahead. Well, I'm saying, saying the, 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 that's the point I made yesterday. I mean, the, the quality, look, I think the quality of the, of the experience for the end user, forgetting about the video and all the quality. The software quality. I mean, building software today right. is very complicated. Right. It's a difficult right. process. So to ask a company to do uh, a superb video codec, you know, superb uh, server, this and that, and then deliver something that can compare, let's say, with a with, with an Apple application or you know an Adobe right. application, right. that's asking for a lot. Okay. So in that sense, I think the ability to decouple the two. In right. other words, somebody does the engine, right, right. and somebody else does right. the the overlay. Yeah. Right. I think that's actually a very powerful model. It worked well for the web. I'm always astounded right. by the right. sophistication of web applications, drag and drop and this and that. I mean, who would think that you would be, right, you have such yeah. sophistication, right, from a, uh, from a web application. I, I come from an era, you know, we're typing HTML and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so it's fantastic yeah. to see that, but it's right. also liberating because you don't have to do that anymore, right? Right, right. It's Somebody right. else does yes, it. Exactly. So that's actually, I think yeah. it's, a, it's a very powerful model. Yeah, and, and see, from a software point of view, abstraction is a key. So offering abstraction layer. So you can have, okay, I separate the, the signaling and maybe also I separate the interface with, 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 the, with the OS. So offering abstraction. So guys can plug in and plug out right. new modules. Right. There right. is a new right. signaling. Okay. There is a new codec. Okay. Right. Uh, and something else. Right. And so that, that offering provides abstraction, the platform yeah. for innovation and that sort of thing as well. Which is, and and yeah. that's also, I mean, it goes beyond WebRTC, but it's something I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm seeing quite often now that a lot of software products, and even more on hardware, we, we tend to put a lot of features. We are engineers, we love technology, we love features, we put a lot, a lot, complex, very fascinating, and then we, a real user, use, if I'm optimist, 20% of them. Right. So right. the idea of being, and the cloud can, can be key on this process, the idea of being able to uh, Use plug in the services that I want or the modules that I want, and don't don't have the others, and maybe don't pay for the others either. Uh, that, that that will be key for for WebRTC, but for a lot of different products. And the, the cloud there can 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 be well essential. Yeah, I think I think uh, from the uh, from the business side of things, and also, you know, I think technically there's there's merits to uh, to the approach. I I, th I agree with what's been said. From the business side, to actually foster adoption, you've got you know not only audio and video, but you have a data channel, and um, I think we're going to see a lot of the impacts in like customer care because uh, for the first time, yeah, you can integrate, not interoperate with the uh, the legacy systems. I think there'll be JavaScript libraries written for that, but you'll also be able to feed in contextual information, customer information, customer data into these customer care things. So you'll start to see companies knowing more about their customers. I mean, it's, it's like Facebook, you get tailored ads. When you call into a contact center using WebRTC in the future, you're gonna get that personalized experience. It's gonna be, you know, oh, Mary Barnes, you know, right, you know right. how was, yeah. how was, how was, you know, your visit to Port Porto? Right, and, right, you know, right. you'll start to get all of this information. Right, and how do you, this, the new Scotty Vest, is that working for you? The new yeah. ladies trench coat Scotty Vest, yeah. Exactly, so I, I think uh, you'll, you'll start to, people, companies will leverage that that data channel to start to customize the uh, the customer care experience right, and customize. Right. Um, yeah, no, I yeah. think that's a really good point for the online retail stuff, which is huge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think for, for me, you know, if I think how how we use sessions, you know, we have this IMTC 
meetings, etc. The, the modality where you know, we're on the call, we're going to put a, a Word document that everybody's looking at. You're going to edit it in real time. You see the annotation marks. Yeah. Uh, you will discuss it. We'll uh, save it when we're done. Exactly. Distribute right. it via email. We're done. Yeah. So, so you have a live, you know, the, exactly. the document live is a work. Session. It's right. a live document. Right. You edit it right. and you ship it. So that's that's a very effective way right. to run a meeting. And in fact, everybody now has gravitated towards that kind of. Right, uh, right, right. Mode of operation. It's tremendously much yes. more effective because you're not dealing with email threads on discussions exactly. that, that have to cross, yes. you know, time yeah. zones and delays, and it takes forever just to tweak text. That yes, and I, and, and I think the more yeah. the applications follow that, meaning that they, they are written in a way that facilitates a, a productive workflow, right, right? and make right. that easy for the user, that process. Right. Exactly. Okay? Mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, yeah. Maybe, you know, you could click a button, the, the document is uh, shared with all the participants. I mean, yeah. uh, this sort of functionality will be very effective for, for people. Right, no, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. But that requires experience with the technology, meaning after people use it, they have to bring feedback to application developers who then right. will custom make. Like you saw it, for example, uh, Jeff King of the Zula app, app, right? It had exactly. a component to vote on an opinion, right? That's right. a nice component because indeed, when you have a, you know, when you want to collect opinions, you can do that offline, right? Just post it, and then everybody will comment on it. That's neat. Right. That's useful. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to yeah. convey in a meeting to collect opinions, right? right. Like if no, somebody needs to exactly. to yes. review and approve something, just exactly. throw it out there. Have a, have a and at the end of the day, right. Right. you know, I yes. saw it in my airplane or at home yes. or whatever. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you got the feedback. You don't even oh, yeah. need to run a meeting. So that's. That's what I mean that, that you know, it integrates right, with the right. workflow. It needs to optimize okay. the yeah, workflow, yeah, exactly, yeah. for people to use the tool, yeah. yes, yes. Change how they do things day to day. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. save time and add efficiency. Okay, so I did want to get on to the, the topic and delve into that in a little bit more detail about the security, right? So the question is really, do we need more security in the protocols, right? Is, is that where we have gaps? Is it in the devices themselves, the way they're deployed in the network, or are there applications, or is it all? I mean, my opinion is that it may be all. I think there's probably less issues with the protocols than there are with how people have deployed devices and equipment in the network. But yeah, I would I would agree with that. I mean, like, uh, you know, how many? Again, I don't know the answer. This isn't rhetorical, but you know, how many enterprises are deploying just you know? RTP versus like SRTP, right? right? right. Uh, if if they're if it's a mixed bag, then you know it's as secure as whatever the the, the call. But the least common denominator. Exactly. Yes. So I think that there's there are there are security gaps in the way that uh, there, you know, I would just assume that there's security in, in the way that people have deployed it, and there is today, and there will be when when WebRTC comes out. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's you know WebRTC specific, and I think the fact of the matter is <coughs> is that. You know, security is a trade-off between cost and convenience. I mean, right, right, you can right. make it as secure right. as you want, depending yeah. you know, how much money right. are you willing right. to spend. <laughs> but right. it also requires user training and right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the question is, yeah. are users going to want expect a higher level of security and privacy based upon you know recent events? Exactly. Right. And the knowledge <laughs> that in the end, no matter how much you know, well. <laughs> how much high much effort you do, yep. you know, it's out mm. in the open. Then we go to the other side. Well, you know what? Yeah. What the heck? I mean, it's, yeah. right. and, I mean, it's they're, public they're, anyway. Right, exactly. And that's the mentality some people have. They've totally given up that on the concept true. that yes. there is any concept of privacy, yeah. right? And many people have learned some of that the hard way about, you know, you yeah. shouldn't put things in the email unless you, you don't have an issue with them appearing on the internet, right? Yep. So, publicly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, I, it's JP Morgan said, uh, just to quote uh, yeah. a famous person, that uh, think a lot, say a little, write nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's the answer. A, a, a key should be for me security is not enough to told. It's not that first you have all your application, your protocol right. like this, then once you're done, you say, okay, now let's bring in security. The security right, should be there thought. since the very first moment when you design things. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, it's, it's never complete. Security is never 100% done. Okay, now I'm secure. But, but still, you, 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 you need to start thinking about security when you design protocols and deeper bore when you design software. There are two different kinds of security. But secure software it will be a key. Right. And, and yeah, I mean, when, when I heard WebRTC is web, therefore it's secure. 
Right. Say, well, uh, yeah, that, no, yeah. No, it's scary. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's not. The web is not secure no. just because it's a web. Right, it's right, right. <laughs> The, the little bit parallel, it just dawned on me. Uh, I want to bring a, a, a parallel between bureaucracies, okay? In, in, in Europe, in some countries, the, the position of the government is that you're probably lying. So if you bring a document, you have to prove that, for example, that the signature is yours, which may mean you have to go to the police station the, to the get the- right. uh, Yeah, right. and in fact, right. it's not like the notary in the States okay. where you can go anywhere, like a pharmacy right. or something. No, right. it's like, it has to be a police station or something oh, okay. like that. Okay. In the States, you can give to your bank, for example, a letter with your signature, yeah. that's good enough. Yeah. Now, if it's proven to be uh, uh, false, there are repercussions. Yeah. But the system uh, is, is, uh, considers you as uh, truthful. Well, you have to bring your driver's license. You do have to show ID, and that gets recorded. Okay. Well, not in any communication, though, but in, in, yeah. in the... In, the, in, in the, their little handwritten book thingy huh? that they keep, yeah. Okay, but the... The, 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 <laughs> the notaries the, keep that. Not a, forget the notary. If you go yeah. to the bank, not, I'm not right. saying in a situation where it's required to have a notarized. Uh, oh, okay. 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 Right. But right. in any communication, right. you can just send a letter with your signature. Right. It's considered yeah. to be your signature. Yeah. Oh, no, you're Nobody right. will question you're it. Right. Yeah. In, 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 uh, in Europe, typically, they will question it and they will oh, want okay. to put. So, what, do I try, what, what I'm trying to say that that yeah. creates a bureaucracy that hinders progress. Why? Because all the processes have to go through this extra step of. Yeah. of uh, so, if you overdo it, in other words, with security, you can ha end well, up exactly. in situations it's where the economy is at a, you know, right. at a much slower pace for the small percentage of violations. Right. It's, so it's in some instances, it's right. better to, to tolerate violations and go after them after the fact, meaning after they happen, right. and then have right. very strict right. uh, 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 repercussions for those who commit, uh, you know, if, if they're caught, of course, but anyway, uh, than, 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 than have everybody pay a price for, right. for you know, extra security. So. Right. I, I wonder how users are going to react to that. I mean, like, again, just assume a colleague, you, you, if it's not secure, how does that get conveyed to the user? Does it go through well, every single link well, right, in that, right. in, you know, does it go right. from every single right. hop and say, oh, there's an insecure thing here, and then you relay that across? I mean, does it, the security icon mean the well, same Well, I mean, thing? this is a good question. And the average Ooh. user, I can guarantee you, does not have a clue what clue, the security icon right. means, and they don't understand the difference between an HTTP and an HTTPS website. Yeah. Yeah. And apparently the one statistic I heard is only about 20% of websites are actually HTTPS enabled. And I have found doctors' websites asking for people's social security numbers, personal medical history, totally in the clear. And I've actually contacted them, and they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's startling for those of us that understand the technology, but the reality is the average person does not. Yeah. And I mean, obviously that, the doctor's office is paying somebody to do their website, and yeah, that person is yeah. clueless, right? They weren't yeah. asked to provide security, so they don't provide it. That's the so same yeah. as screaming the numbers out the window. I mean. Oh, yeah, Can no, you hear me? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What? exactly. It's, it's, it's <laughs> I mean, identity theft, right? It's just totally true, opening true, the true, door true. for that. That should, so, yeah. Yeah, that should not be allowed, actually. Right. But that's why an instance where yeah. it should be forbidden to not uh, use encryption. Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. Because the extra cost, by the way, for the, for the end user is nothing. It's, uh, yes, it's exactly. For the end user. Well, yeah. yes. It costs for the, for the, for the, uh, for the provider, you know, it's, you it's get a certificate. It's, it's nominal. nominal. It's nominal. But there's, there's yeah. no zero. For the end user, it's zero, though. Right, yeah. right, right. And then you they get a value out of it. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Right, so, okay, so we've touched on the identity privacy. I think we're probably, we're getting a little bit, we wanted a couple more questions and then we, we do want to give time for the audience Q&A. So um, one of the last ones I think this is a good one to talk about is many people, and we've talked about this before, people use multiple devices depending upon applications, right? I mean, we all have, you know, at least four devices that we use on a daily basis. And so what changes do you envision in the types of devices and the user experience in the next 10 years? Am I just going to walk around with my one favorite device, or are we going to continue to have multiple, or are they going to pick up and detect that the other one's there, and depending upon the application, and that sort of thing? <laughs> okay, so uh, from, from the device manufacturing company. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that I see things, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think what we've seen is a consolidation of a lot of functionality into a, into a, into a small form factor that's very smart that we carry around called a smartphone or an iPhone or an Android phone. Um, I think as we start to see smaller devices with longer battery life that are doing things that can quantify yourself or actually make the environment around you uh, more aware of you as a person, I think we'll start to see some disaggregation of functionality. So okay. you'll, you'll have 
uh, technology in your clothing, likely in the next five years, probably in your shoes. Uh, there's only a few spots on your body where you're going to hang stuff, mm -hmm. you know, maybe your head, maybe your wrist, maybe around your waist. Um, but those will be primaries of real estate for companies to compete for, I think, in the future. And uh, I, I see, uh, you know, even if it's heads-up display, you know, if, if, if you don't need the display on your phone because you have something that you're wearing that can actually project into your retina or, you know, you're wearing, I mean, the, the phone gets smaller. It becomes more of a hub. It's, it's the hub of, of communication for you and data. So that's, that's my opinion. Yeah, this, for me, speaking from experience, what I, what I have found particularly effective is the concept of having a, a, a cloud-based account that contains all, all my data. For me, that's extremely powerful because I can make changes on any of the devices that I use and it will propagate everywhere. I think that's yeah. essential, first of all. So uh, 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 then, depending on the situation, I have found different devices useful for different things. Right. And that's unfortunate because you know, with, with new generations of devices coming up, your backpack instead of uh, lightening up, <laughs> okay, becomes you know <laughs> even yeah. heavier because you know there's yeah. a laptop, but there's the iPad. Less, but they have more exactly, devices. there are more right. devices. Right. But on the other hand, I have to admit that that uh, it's a you know the, the the iPhone was a revelation, the the iPad itself was a revelation, and it, it had to find its way in the day-to-day -day right. workflow, right, right? How exactly right. you would use it. Right. So it did. It did, the apps adjusted, and now actually I'm, I'm, you know, I'm extremely happy. So I was a very interesting, it was very interesting to see the Corning video. I don't know if I just, everybody must have seen it. It was played uh, over uh, NG Cube uh, presentation, oh, okay. okay? So it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Alba Corning that shows basically all these different displays that will exist in the future. The table, you know, glasses oh, okay. everywhere. Right. You know, you right. you bring okay. your phone, you touch it, you touch uh, the surface, and then automatically it activates as a screen, yeah. correlating right. okay. to right. your own identity. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me now, I, I'm I'm very happy that I can throw away my iPhone, go to a store, and in in 10 minutes, literally, be up and running. For me, that's very powerful and actually makes right. me feel good mm -hmm. that I'm not tied and tethered to a single device. Same goes for my laptop, by the way. Uh, yeah. So with a little care, you can actually be. You don't care about your devices. You can throw them away because you can recover. So, so for me, I think that, uh, that's a very useful model. And so, um, barring, you know, we may see more innovations like the iPad. I don't know. I mean, people may come up with clever devices. That's, that's great. But I think the modality of you have an identity which is, exists in the, in the cloud your, with your, your accounts and email right. and this right. and that right. and your right. calendar and the contacts. And then, and then the, the other devices come in and, and attach to that. And they facilitate what you're doing. I think that's the right model. So we are no we are no longer device centric, okay? We are data centric, and the data exists somewhere else. And the devices are just tools to get to, to manipulate the data. and right, yes. right, present the data yes. depending upon the app exactly. specific yes. application. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm really in favor of uh, yeah, it's multiple device for sure, without the problem of of data, without the problem of identity. So you you have data. You have also your services maybe it's running away, but you have your multiple device you can choose. And then the, the key point for me is that the user will decide which device to use. I mean, also if you think about enterprise network like this, it's more and more common to, to the user decide which, which tablet bring there and which application install. So it will be the user that will decide, not the enterprise. Right. Uh, right. And so it's, it's impossible to control. Just give the... the, the the possibility to use whatever you want, but in the good way with the, with the services and data, easy to access. Right. But there's a question with all that. I mean, it, it, you have a situation now where very few, very big companies have control and access to that data, right? So as we, as we proceed in life right. now, in that generation, it's like monopoly. Whoever gets a corner dominates the game. Well, so exactly. so in, in different application spaces like search, social, uh, uh, messaging. Right. You already right. have huge companies, right, that right. have access data and they have a controlling position. And they can, oftentimes they have used that position to go after other markets, right? Meaning, mm -hmm. you, you exactly. know, remember the, yeah. in the old days where Microsoft, you know, was using Monopoly in the operating system to dominate in the browsers. Right. Now other companies are getting big and they try to do similar things in other areas. So right. that's another it's problem a, for right. us as a society how to protect that because it's convenient on one hand and we're willing to do that for very little money, right? right where where exactly. in reality, maybe we should be paid to do that rather than me paying Apple 
to, to host my data to them, <laughs> maybe actually they should be paying me right. to okay. allow yeah. them to use all that Give information. Give you iTunes credits. Sorry? iTunes credits. There you go. You know? yeah. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> you remember the subsidy <laughs> thing that Jeff said? Oh, yeah, we yeah. don't want to leave the building yeah, and not yeah, ask for our subsidy, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's ask for our subsidy. We want to be paid for our right, data right. because it yeah. generates billions well, it, it of dollars. Does. Yeah. Yes. It does, absolutely. Yeah. So that's really, yeah. yeah. So is that going to change or is that going to happen? So let's, let's file a petition to the, let's file a petition. Let's file a yeah. petition. Yeah. Let's file a petition. <laughs> 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 petition. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, and I think I think it's also going to be you're going to you're, you're going to want you want you want to receive payment for some of your data, some of your other data you may want to keep just to yourself or to your physician. For example, if you're wearing a heart rate monitor, sure, is that my data or is that Google's data? Uh, that should be my data. Mm -hmm. But if I have a sensor that I'm wearing on me that's telling me yeah. it's raining outside, well, maybe I want to broadcast that out so I, right. everybody right. can right. take right. advantage of that. Right. Yeah. right, but even yeah. the, the issue of your your heart monitor data, right? The yeah. question is, does that belong to you, or does that go into your medical database file that the government has control over because of the all the healthcare stuff, right? So that's exactly it brings about a lot of, again these privacy security issues sort of things, right? Yeah, and if yeah. there's like a yeah like a consistent uh, you know format for that data, it's heart rate data, you can pick that up on the network and then you're, yeah, I mean, people can just, right. the government could, yeah, absolutely, it's, yeah. that's kind of scary. Okay. Right. Yeah. So interesting, some <laughs> interesting things coming down, down the road in the next 10 years. So we're curious, uh, do, do people have questions? We have a few minutes to go through some Q&A. Yeah, Patrick? Thank you, uh, very, very interesting uh, debate and discussions. I wanted to stir up things a little bit uh, to mm. see if uh, <laughs> we can have uh, That's the idea. <laughs> some, some other interesting debates. You know, we're looking, it seems, always at the incremental changes. You know, right. Whatever you say, yeah. we're still using protocols that, you know, well, that are 20 years old, almost right. as old yeah. as the ITC. I, I actually I, had that as a last question, so you're... you're and uh, yeah. one of my colleagues, uh, Paul Jones, is uh, uh, a big advocate of uh, starting on a new clean sheet. And his main argument is H323 is 16 years old. Right. Mm -hmm. SIP is 16 years old. So is it time to, to right. start and, and again, that's, that's, get that's rid of all these problems from the past? In H323, we had to take over this compatibility stuff from H320 and all the stuff. In SIP, right. you're still dealing with SDP and things that have restrictions. So is it time to start? Well, that's, a, that's the million dollar question, right? And, and, uh, I'd like to also add. Um, of ganging up with. Oh, no, no, this, this <laughs> okay, is, this, no, believe it or not, that was my last question oh. on here. So yeah, I planted Patrick in the audience to ask So the, that the question is everybody here seems <laughs> to agree that uh, Web, WebRTC is going to be the solution. But is, that, is that, I mean, there's a lot of talk about, there's a lot of people in the room, not, I mean, there are certain degrees of people. Um, I think that WebRTC has its, as its usefulness, but as a replacement for SIP or 3 to 3, I don't think so. I, I, I right. I'm, I don't I'm think on so. the page. I just I think want to make that. No. I think right. we have universal agreement on that. So yeah. the question again gets back to what, what Patrick yeah. said. Do we need another protocol? Well, I know that's the, the million dollar question, right? So or do we have enough to build a lot of these applications we're talking about already, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, we can see, for example, in WebRTC that are trying to use S reuse STP for the, their JSET protocol, the pain of doing that because they are exceeding the limitations of the original STP design. The same time, they actually tried to do a new version of SDP, SDPNG, but no one was willing to rip up their network and deal with the impact of that change. So that's you know. And over as, as I'll present next in my next session, um, there was a couple of interesting things that were raised in the last couple of days of use cases which neither of the current generation of protocols nor WebRTC could do, such as the wall, the video wall being able to communicate with a wall, or being able to put your phone down and communicate on a table, being able to do all those, that video that Oliver had, he's here, I don't think he's here, but he had that really good video of what the future would be. I think, I think that that's what we should be looking at, is, is looking at that type of functionality. And as what, what Paul Jones has been doing for many years, has put forward yeah. some years ago, was maybe we should stop and think, how do we achieve that type of functionality? Right, well, and this is one thing, you know, for example, and we're doing the telepresence work in IETF. We are developing a new protocol to carry what we consider more application-specific information, stuff that's unique to telepresence and multi-stream. And there, we, we hit a level of conflict, though, because 
the traditional people think that we should just throw everything in SDP. But that, that limits the extensibility of your application and it makes it much more brittle, right? So I mean, this gets down to it. Do we want to keep reusing these protocols or we, can we build other application protocols? And something I learned very, uh, from, from the first day of the history of the IMTC was how it had to take an entire group of people to make a new protocol. 323. Right. And is there, any, is there any, any motivation within the group to even do that? Are we just going to continue on the way we're continuing on? Or are we going to come together and start saying, hey, maybe there is something we, we need to do and maybe we need to come together and, as a group and make that decision? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. And I don't know if there's university students that are working on some of that, right? I would think there might be. I mean, that SIP came from the university environment, right? It came yeah. from Columbia. So the question is, are there people I, working on that sort of thing? I, I think you need like a clean room or something where you can get people that haven't been in industry for a while that are, you know, graduate students that are researching because there is a lot of, well, we did that and that didn't work, you know, and, there, and some of that needs to, you, you kind of need to have that isolation and just let people kind of. And I learned from, like, the biggest thing I learned from, from Jeff this morning yeah. was, he was Forrest Gump. He was from the outside. He knew nothing about right, it. Right, exactly. Maybe that's the way we've got to look at it. Maybe we're in too deep. We see we lose right. the forest with the trees. Kind right. Of thing. Well, yeah. that's why I, I wish Jeff was able to be on this panel to, to get his perspective on that question yeah. as well, right? So, yeah. 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 Okay. I think we ended on the, I think the right note here. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, gentlemen, for participating. Thank you. I think it was really good. Yeah. I enjoyed it.